we have on the call uh, the chair, the former chair of the Anti Poll Tax Federation, Tommy Sheridan. How are you? There? Can you hear me, Tommy? I can hear you, Cuspin. I'm hoping you can hear me. I can, yeah. Um, Excellent. So look, I I was in uh, Glasgow as a student, and I I thought I'd been uh, the, 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 there was some kind of practical joke going on here that that I just got up there, and they said you had to start paying this uh, poll tax, this community charge that wasn't um, in England. Uh, can you tell us why they started it in Scotland, and what was your response? Because you were kind of pivotal to that campaign against it. How, how, can you remember the whole? background to it? Um, Crispin, the movement against the poll tax um, was embedded in the Scottish um, hatred of Thatcher uh, and all things Tory uh, uh, for that point of view. Uh, you have to remember that Scotland hasn't voted Tory since 1955. Um, so when we got to the 1980s um, and 79, uh, prior to that, when Thatcher was elected, we didn't vote Tory. Uh, unfortunately, England did, uh, and we were lumped with Thatcher. Um, by '83, um, despite the mass unemployment, and, and we know um, that she had the quirk of the Falklands War, which probably saved her bacon, because at '82, she was the most unpopular Prime Minister in British opinion poll history and was heading mm -hmm. for an absolute doing at the polls. However, um, as always happens for the ruling classes, wars. Uh, can always uh, boost uh, support through the manufactured jingoism. Uh, and, and that's what happened, and, and she recovered. And she won the 1983 election, but not in Scotland. She was trounced in Scotland, absolutely trounced. Um, we then had the 87 uh, election. Um, sadly, uh, you guys, uh, sorry to keep blaming you, but you guys voted Tory again. And we rejected them universally. We, um, we reduced them to a rump uh, up here in Scotland. So with those three defeats in a row, Thatcher despised Scotland. She, she couldn't understand why we would never voted for her right-wing privatisation agenda, her uh, economic trickle-down theories. Um, we, we rejected that. We had still had a sense of communitarianism. We still had a sense of the uh, need for public ownership and values of, of, of community. Um, and therefore, when uh, her and Nicholas Ridley and others got around the table to devise the flagship policy for the new term, the third term, which was going to be the community charge, um, because what they had, you remember, Crispin, you might be too young to, to, to recall this, but uh, the rates system was an old system that, that used to collect money for local authorities. And the rates were based on roughly on the size of a property. So the bigger the property you lived in, the higher your rates built. But I would argue that no one in working class communities, no one knew what their rates bill was because your rates was paid along with your rent. So when you went along to pay your rent bill, the rates bill was added into it, but it was such a small part of the bill that nobody really knew what their rates was. So it was an irrelevance for most working class people. But who it did affect was the toffs, was the rich, the people who lived in big houses and they were angry that the Tories were doing nothing about these big rates bills which kept going up because as the Tories were cutting public expenditure, councils had very limited tools to raise more money. So one of the tools they used is the increased rates um, for big properties. So uh, a lot of their natural support were saying, no, this isn't on, we need to change this. So Ridley and co, uh, along with that, have come up with this idea, let's change the rate system. And instead of having a property-based tax, let's have a tax that's based on your head. Let, let's have a human tax. Let, let's tax everybody over the age of 18 in a household. Um, and of course, it doesn't. you don't need to be a genius to work out that instead of one rates bill for a family of four, you were now going to have four poll tax bills in that same household. So it was going to be a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich because part and parcel of the plan was to charge the poll tax at a level that meant the rich were paying much less than they used to pay under the rates, but the working class were going to pay much more. And we used to have a, an analogy up here, Crispin, you probably remember, if, if you can recall, 
Uh, it was the, the Duke and the Dustman. And the Duke would be paying the same or less money for his castle than the Dustman uh, who's living in his council house. That, that, that's how bad that the poll tax uh, was. And to add a wee bit of spice to the whole equation, Thatcher decided, well, let's try it out. Who can we try it out on? I know, they pesky Scots, they never vote for me anyway. Let's give them it first. Let's punish them. Let, let's use them as human guinea pigs. And that's exactly what happened. And that's why on um, 31st of March 1989, we got the poll tax a year before England and Wales. Uh, it's worth putting in a wee uh, note that they never ever tried it in Northern Ireland. Uh, I wonder why, but th th there you go. Um, so they gave us it in Scotland uh, uh, first, and we heard about it in the late 80s. We knew that in 87 it was in their manifesto. So around about eight, late 87, 88, we started to learn more about this community charge and just how bad it was going to be. And we, we delved into working class history, the, 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 the Watt Tyler revolt, the, the, the last great tax revolt uh, was based on a head tax. And so we, we realised that we had to do something. And the, the good point, uh, I think, for this show, um, Crispin, as I've listened to the earlier contributions, absolutely fasc fascinating from Arthur um, and the Chartists and the whole issue of, of petitions, um, because that was the first line of uh, attack for the official movement, for the official Labour Party and the trade union movement in Scotland, was we're going to petition against this. So there was massive amount of petitions. And one of the petitions was, a, in retrospect, was a bit silly petition because it was called Stop It. Um, and it was to stop the poll tax. However, it got confused with registration because one of the things about the poll tax was you had to register for it. Um, and when the Labour movement introduced this Stop It campaign, a lot of people thought, well, I'm not going to register. Problem is... Problem is, by not registering for the poll tax, you removed yourself from the voting register as well. Uh, and a lot of people just didn't realise the consequence of this. However, um, the Labour movement, officially, the Labour Party, they got involved and it was sign the petition. So people, by the hundreds of thousands, signed petitions. And we were against the poll tax. We had banners. We started to form anti-poll tax unions. But what became clear, I mean, for goodness sakes, we didn't vote for them in 79, we didn't vote for them in 83, we didn't vote for them in 87. What, what the hell was a petition going to do, right? You know, so it, it became clear that we needed more than petitions. So from a grassroots through the anti-poll tax unions, which were set up in housing estates all across Scotland, that's helped to set mine up in Pollock in, in Glasgow. There was a similar set up in Govan and Possel and Easterhouse, uh, Casimil, all over. Uh, and we, we set up a a commitment, it was like a pledge card. And to join the anti-poll tax union, you pledged yourself to refuse to pay. To civil disobedience. You just said, look, we're not paying it. We've done everything that you can legally. So the only thing left now is to embark on a campaign of civil disobedience. And again, delving into working class history, we learned from the popular councillors in East End of London, uh, better to break uh, the law than break the poor. And that became a, a slogan that we adopted in the early days in the anti-poll tax uh, uh, campaign. We, we said loud and clear, look, we'll, we've reached the depths here. Thatcher has absolutely ruined us. We need to fight back. Crispin, I have to say, in those early meetings, they were well-attended meetings because people were worried. But to try to persuade people to take on Thatcher was difficult because this was the woman who had been dubbed the Iron Lady. She'd taken on the steel workers. She'd taken on the nurses. She'd taken on the miners. I mean, this is the woman who appeared to be invincible. Galtieri had been taken on, you know, because, you know, it was, it was all Thatcher. It was nothing to do with anybody else. It was all Thatcher. Uh, that's the, the way the, the media promote these things. And, and therefore, a lot of the communities thought, Tommy, what can we do? You know, she's invincible. And we tried to persuade people that she'd made a mistake with the poll tax. Because what she did, unlike attacking the nurses, the steel workers, the miners, what she did is she attacked us all at once. We were all getting attacked with the poll tax. Okay, she attacked Scotland first, and that is a wee bit uh, of a, a tactical nuance. But by bringing in attacks that, that attacked all of the working class, she gave us her form of unity. 
we were all united in opposition to the tax and we started the campaign to try and commit people to mass non-payment. And you know, Crispin, it was very, very close. The Labour Party in Scotland, um, initially they ruled out completely, no way, we can't, we can't support lawbreaking. However, they were forced to have a special conference um, in Govan, in Govan Town Hall, um, in the late 88, um, uh, if my memory serves me right, and it was so close. It was so close. The constituencies voted for mass non-payment. They said, look, there's nothing else we can do. Mass non-payment's all that we've got. The only thing that saved the bacon of the Labour leadership in those days was the, the block vote of the, the GMB and some of the electric, electricians union and others. They uh, were uh, told to vote against the mass non-payment proposal. So therefore, the Labour Party came out against mass non-payment, as did most of uh, the trade unions. There were some honourable exceptions. Fire Brigade Union supported the mass non-payment campaign. The RMT supported mass non-payment campaign. Individual branches of the TGWU and others voted, because this was prior to Unite, of course, they supported the mass non-payment campaign. So we were left largely crisping on our own. We, we didn't really have official backing, so to speak. It was entirely grassroots. Um, the amount of women involved in our campaign was incredible because whether we like it or not, in, in those days, the people who were coming to the meetings was overwhelmingly women because they were worried about the household budget. They were worried how they were going to deal with this extra bill. They just they could hardly deal with the bills they had just now, never mind this extra tax that was being introduced. Uh, and hundreds and thousands of women became involved in, in the campaign. So one of them was my mother, um, who, who was extremely active within um, the anti-poll tax campaign, became known as the as the anti-poll tax woman. Uh, in fact, there was a wee joke. There's a wee joke that just sums that up, um, Crispin. You, you, if you were in Glasgow, you remember there's a paper called the Evening Times, the Glasgow Evening Times, which was very, very popular. And there was a wee cartoon. You used to always a, a, a cartoon in the Evening Times. And the, the, the two wee characters in the cartoon, uh, one would say, uh, I've got uh, my, uh, my auntie Jean uh, is, is for Casimilk. And the other one say, oh, but my auntie Mary, she's... Uh, for Pollock, uh, and the other one says, aye, but my anti-poll tax is for Govan, uh, because anti-poll tax was so widespread, it became so popular. We had um, people from the arts, uh, and, uh, and like, actors like Peter Millen, who's well-known now, wasn't he so well-known then? Um, we had bands like Deacon Blue, which uh, might not be well-known in England, but very well-known in Scotland, Hue and Cry, another well-known band. They were all part and parcel of this mass campaign, um, so we had big demonstrations uh, in, 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 the, in, in late uh, 88, early 89, we had a massive one on March the 30th, I think it was in, in 89, um, and uh, thousands, and we had people coming from England, which was brilliant, because we, we'd started to, to, to spread the idea that, look, you're, you've got this coming, it's in your interest to support us, and people came, uh, and we marched through the streets in the thousands, and we said, we're not paying it, we're, we're going to refuse to pay um, we were told that the sheriff officers, which is equivalent of your bailiffs in, in England and Wales, that they were going to be sent out and they would come into your house and they would take away your furniture uh, and then they would sell it at public auction and they would embarrass you, they would humiliate you, and then they would take the tax from the proceeds of the sale. So we had to go further in the anti-poll tax campaign and we had to say, we're going to prevent the sheriff officers getting into people's houses. Again, borrowing from Labour movement history, we borrowed from the rent strikers, uh, Mary Barber and her army, that, that they stopped the, the landlords in 1914-15 from evicting families and, and governing Mary Hill in Glasgow because they were increasing the rents and trying to take advantage of the, the demand for housing in those days. We took strength from that and we organised phone trees. We, we organised poll tax busters groups everywhere. Uh, and as soon as we heard the sheriff officers were going to somebody's house to they, they call that a pending, which is where they turn up at your house and they price your goods and they price your telly, they price your, your, your settee, your, they price your table, your display cabinet, uh, and then they come later and take it away and sell it. So our job was to stop that happening, uh, Crispin, and, and very, very successfully, we mobilised hundreds, sometimes thousands, in the streets of, of Glasgow, of Dundee, of Dumbarton, of Edinburgh, uh, to stop the sheriff officers getting into people's houses. Now, we were arrested loads of times, and, and, and some people 
were sentenced. Um, my mum was arrested about four times, I think. Um, so uh, these things happen in the course of struggle. However, the campaign itself became very, very popular, uh, Crispin, and we were able to report. I, I was elected. I was involved um, in the Labour Party in those days. I was part of the militant in those days. Um, and therefore, they had a network that was all across England and Wales. And that was very helpful uh, in spreading the movement. Um, and I, I was uh, elected the chair at a big conference uh, in London of the All Britain Anti Poll Tax Federation. And we organised the big march for 1990. Some of you will remember this 31st of March, 1990. And uh, so this was one year into the poll tax in Scotland. And all of the official figures from all of the regional councils in those days uh, showed that the number of non-peers in Scotland had reached a million. So there was a million people had refused to pay. Now, when I say refused to pay, some people, I mean, the anti-poll tax campaign, Tommy Sheridan or anybody else, because uh, there was some very good leading the MPs in those days, Dennis Canavan, uh, uh, one of them, um, we were doing our best to get people to join the army of non-peers. But I've got to say, the biggest recruiting sergeant for non-payment was poverty itself, Crispin, uh, was necessity. People couldn't afford to pay. So uh, although there were some people who were very politically involved who could afford to pay and were refusing to pay, the um, majority of people were, were in the boat of, I can't pay this, I'm, I'm, I just can't afford it. The SNP has to be noted that the Scottish National Party in those days, which was a, a very um, small party in, in terms of representation, only I think there were maybe three or four MPs in Parliament in those days, they tactically, and I have to give them credit for it, they made the decision to support mass non-payment. So for a mainstream political party to come out and support mass non-payment, it was quite radical. Uh, and the truth is they benefited largely from it because they left the Labour Party behind because they were condemning the non-peers. In fact, Labour ran just about every council in Scotland in those days, Crispin. And of course, who was sending out sheriff officers to pin uh, working class families and to threaten them with warrant sales? Labour councils. <laughs> it, does, it does put a wee bit of a, an angle on the old Kinnock speech about uh, the Liverpool Council. Uh, a Labour council, a Labour council sending out redundancy notices. Well, this was Labour councils sending out sheriff officers to impoverish working class families all across Scotland. And it was shameful, absolutely shameful uh, what they did. However, over a million people um, were involved in non-payment. I was fortunate to speak at the demo in Glasgow on the morning of the 31st of uh, March. Um, we had about 40,000 people. We marched from George Square to Queen's uh, Park. It was a fantastic day, absolutely tremendous. But then I was whisked down to London to speak at the All Britain demonstration that was taking place uh, marching uh, to Trafalgar Square. Um, and I got picked up at the um, airport by my good friend John Ellen, who was uh, the secretary uh, at the time, or was he the, the vice chair? I think it was Louise was the secretary. Sorry uh, for that. Um, and no, Steve Nally was the secretary. Please, oh, they, they, these people were all fantastic organisers, um, and they had organised this uh, rally in, in March in London. And when I got uh, off the, the 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 plane and onto the train, the subway through to London, John was full, was buzzing uh, because the turnout had uh, dwarfed their expectations. It was just massive. Uh, by the time I got to Trafalgar Square. Um, you just couldn't see. It was a sea of people. It was absolutely massive. Uh, and I was next up. I was speaking after Tony Ben. Tony Ben was in the middle of speaking, so I get taken up to the plinth. Uh, and Tony, as always, was absolutely tremendous. Um, loved Tony to bits. He was a great help during the anti poll tax campaign. We became good friends. I visited him at his home, and, and he gave us a lot of good advice. Tony was a, a beautiful man, beautiful human, human being. And he congratulated everyone. Um, for standing against Thatcher and called for continued resistance uh, to the anti uh, uh, to, to the poll tax and to support the Scottish uh, non-payment campaign and to, to, to replicate that. So he was calling for mass civil disobedience. A Labour MP, you know, <laughs> how good were those days, eh? A Labour MP calling for mass civil disobedience. Absolutely fantastic. I was next up. Uh, unfortunately, history will show 
that the doors of the South African Embassy swung open and out came the marauding police horses with the batons um, and what happened next was a riot uh, in the middle of London. Uh, London was burning um, um, and although we didn't plan a riot, we didn't call for a riot, what I have to say, um, I think it was Martin Luther King that sometimes said that riots are the language of the dispossessed uh, and, and, and the poor and the powerless. What happened with that riot is in one single event, Thatcher was undermined. Here's the woman that was the Iron Lady. Here's the woman that was invincible. And here's the woman who couldn't even control her own capital city. It was up in flames. And a low mass non-payment killed the poll tax because uh, around nine months later, <clears throat> one stature had been removed and her tears trickled down her cheeks to her joy. Um, we heard Mr. Major in Parliament make a speech about how they were repealing the poll tax. And he said, and I quote, it had become uncollectible, uncollectible. My only question is who made it uncollectible, Crispin? And it was mass non-payment that made it uncollectible. It was working class unity that made it uncollectible. Um, and therefore I'll finish my wee contribution by saying um, the mistake the Tories made in those days was to attack us all at once. I know she attacked Scotland first, but she attacked the, the working class all at once. We were able to transport, to export that campaign to England and Wales, and it became, the, the figures that were, were quoted at the time was 14 million, 14 million non-payers of the poll tax. It had to go, so did Thatcher. She was the captain of that particular ship, and she had to go down with it. And that's why I always say, Crispin, that... Uh, we never just sent uh, the poll tax to the bottom of the sea. We also sent Thatcher to the political knacker's yard where she belonged. Sadly, sadly, uh, the Tories still managed to get back in uh, in 92, I think it was uh, Major. 91 was it? 90, 91 or 92 when Major got elected. We rejected them overwhelmingly again. <laughs> but you guys, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you voted for them again. Um, Hopefully the, the, the pattern of this story can maybe explain why the demand for Scottish independence is so strong uh, and so significant nowadays. We're fed up, Crispin. We're fed up voting against the Tories and getting them. Um, so that's the wee potted yeah. history and I've left with loads of names and loads of incidents, loads of stories um, about the poll tax campaign. But it was a remarkable victory for working class solidarity.